Our sermon text this morning is going to be in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. It's Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 through 13. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Let's pray. Lord, we gather today thankful for your word and spirit. It is by your word being applied to our hearts by your spirit uh, that we are born again. It is by the spirit alone that we can understand your word, have this word be applied to our hearts. Uh, We believe that your word is not given to us for Uh, just something we can do for a few minutes on a Sunday morning, but because it is our necessary food. We need to be fed on your word. We need our faith strengthened. Perhaps we need our our, uh, lives corrected and challenged. Uh, Perhaps we need a greater understanding of your glory. And so we are praying for you to do the work that you intend to do in our hearts and then that you uh, intended to do in giving us this word that we might see the glories of Christ And that we might be helped to walk as faithful servants of Jesus Christ. We need your help for this, for right understanding, for right walking. So bless us with the ministry of your spirit in this hour. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We're continuing in our study of the book of Hebrews. The sense of our passage today is this. uh, Jesus is the brother of the Christian. Now when we say Christian, we're just using the Bible's way of talking about those who have faith in Jesus Christ, those who are repenting of their sins, they recognize that they sin, they're repenting of their sins, they're trusting in Jesus Christ, the Savior, to save them, and then by trusting in Jesus, they are united to Jesus by faith, and they are truly, uh, the Bible says, born again, they are Christians. And so it is the Christian, so not every person, right, but the Christian who can say, Jesus Christ is my brother. That is a marvelous truth that perhaps you don't reflect upon and I don't reflect upon as often as we ought to. And this is uh, the the, the theological kind of concept behind this is what we call the incarnation. Uh, The incarnation speaks about how Jesus is the eternal son of God, he's, he's totally God, totally divine, he's, he's existed eternally, and at a time, he took on flesh, right? He, he becomes a man. He is both fully God and fully man, right? That's the doctrine of the incarnation, and we're focusing on that aspect of Jesus taking on flesh, Jesus becoming a man, that's what we're talking about, and because he is a man, for those who are trusting in, in him, he is their brother. And again, that's the wonderful truth we want to reflect upon right now. Now, there's many blessings of Jesus being uh, our brother. Uh, one that we'll come to next week is that he can actually help us when we're tempted. So if you're ever tempted, uh, then you might want to come back next week because we can remember and we'll reflect upon how Jesus helps us when we are tempted Uh, We would also say, and this is a bit bit of our application today, uh, that he is with us in our suffering. He is with us in our persecution. He's with us even when we face death. And that was the situation facing the people who were reading the book of Hebrews, who, who first received that book of Hebrews. But isn't that the situation that faces us? We have troubles. We have trials. We're, we're tempted to not trust in the Lord. We're tempted to not wait on the Lord. And so this is a passage I think that's really going to help us. Uh, But also because Jesus is a man and uh, became a man, he actually can be our substitute, right? He can be our, he can die in our place. But he actually had to become a man in order to die in our place, right? And really that has been the focus of Hebrews so far, Jesus 
uh, is greater than the angels. That's what we've been talking about. In our very section, though, we've been focusing on the incarnation. We've been focusing on the fact that Jesus is greater than angels because he is the exalted Lord, right? He is high and lifted up. He, th- we are focusing now on the, the divinity of him and also the glory that he has because he's come through death, saved uh, his own, and now is at the right hand of the Father. That's part of what we focus on, but we also are focusing on, well, okay, yes, he's now at the right hand of the Father. What was the path he took? And the path he took was a suffering path, a, a, a path of, again, taking on flesh, a path of dying. Uh, And then a path of rising victorious over sin, death, and the grave. I mean, the grave and and our slavery to sin can be broken through Jesus Christ and and so many other things. But again, he had to first die on the cross. So, So our focus then is that it was fitting that salvation should happen through one who suffered as one of us, right, as a human being. Because, honestly, the plan of redemption... We'll get back to that in a minute, what that means. Was for the Messiah to save his brothers. That was the plan all along. The Messiah was going to save his brothers. And and that's one of the things that the the passage wants us to consider uh, today. Most basically then, to save his brothers, Jesus needed to be a brother. That is, he needed to be a man. He he could, as, as God, he couldn't die, right? So he had to take on flesh so that he could even die, Right? And so uh, he had to become a man. The plan of redemption then reminds us, though, that the Bible is one big story. And we'll come back to this later in the sermon, but we need to get in our mind that the Bible is one big story. And we might even just say it's one big rescue operation, right? God determines to save sinners who don't deserve it. He sets his love on the undeserving because there's only undeservings. Right? And relentlessly does all that is necessary to save all that he intends to save. And so the, the Lord is powerfully working out his plan of redemption. And you can just see that from, as it were, Genesis to Revelation. And the beautiful part of the story is that information actually is dropped along the way. Uh, if you read your Old Testament carefully, you will see where the story is going. And again, that'll be something we focus on uh, in the latter verses of our study today. Um, and, uh, but the aspect of saving his brothers is both how we hear Jesus speaking about himself. Jesus will, in his ministry, talk about who his brother and sister is. But it actually is a correct understanding of how the Messiah was revealed in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, uh, prophecies about the Messiah were already saying he was going to save his brothers. And again, that's... Uh, a big part of what we're going to look in our text. So, well, let's just hop into the text. We keep talking about getting there. Let's, let's go ahead and do it. We're just going to look verse by verse. Uh, we've got four verses, so here we go. First verse. Jesus, this is verse 10. Jesus then, uh, I think this is what this verse is about, is qualified for his office as high priest. I think that's what this verse is talking about. So let's read the verse again, 2.10. For it was fitting that he by whom... Or I'm sorry, for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. I think the central idea here, it is fitting, right, that Jesus take on flesh so that he could die in our place. Now, it's an odd way to begin this. Like, who's to decide whether it's fitting for, for uh, you know, Jesus to take on flesh? I mean, did, were they asking you? Were they asking the author of Hebrews? Is this fitting? And I think probably, uh, I've been helped by some commentators to see this, but I think probably the best way to think about it is it was fitting based on who God is that he would save exactly in this way. So God then is not trying to meet our standard. Does this fit the bill? No, I think that's okay. Right? He's not looking for our approval to say that it's fitting. <laughs> no, God is setting the standard. He's the standard of everything, by the way. And by his own standard of righteousness and justice, it was fit, it was right that he save in exactly this way. So we're not suggesting here that, that God is submitting to our standards. It's just God being consistent with his own standards. Uh, he, consistent with his character, consistent with his righteousness, he is going to save in this way. 
And, and then this passage is already talking about the greatness of Jesus just right out of the gate. It says he's the one who made everything. And this is, of course, the doctrine of creation. We know God made everything. We know you don't have breath unless God gave you breath. And we, we've got that. But it also says, almost as a quick aside or a quick uh, statement, and everything was made for him. Right? And uh, even though this is a passing statement, notice how matter-of-factly the Bible states something that so many people disagree with. That they were made for God. N not to live how they want. It's not up to you to decide how you might live your life. God did not make you that way. He made you for him. Now you might have thought, well, I've been ignoring him a lot. and I guess I'm in trouble. And I'm just here to say, yeah, pretty well. I mean, if you've been ignoring him, right, and, and not living mindful that you were made for him, you know, the, well, maybe the Lord is using this as a wake-up call. You were made for him. You, you are not made to live how you think you ought to live. You are made for him, for his glory, and to live exactly the way that he calls you to live. God made all things for his glory, right? And our, in our fallen world, God glorifies himself by saving people from their sins. As a matter of fact, if I just gave you a wake-up call a minute ago, I'm trying to give you the gospel now. If you've been ignoring... <laughs> God, uh, that we call sin, actually God calls sin, uh, he has made a provision for your sin of ignoring him and living like you didn't have a God and you didn't have to give thanks to him and you didn't need to worship and serve him and on and on. He's made provision for you uh, by sending Jesus uh, to save. So, uh, but God brings glory to himself by not, as it were, crushing you like you deserve, crushing me like I deserve. Uh, he sends his son, in a sense, to be crushed for us, to die in our place, that we can be saved. So this is how God brings glory to himself, by gloriously saving undeserving sinners. And by that, I mean you and me. And so what we want to do right now, because we want to worship every Sunday, is sort of spend a few moments marveling. <laughs> Just marvel at the glory and grace of your Savior, right? <laughs> marvel at the beautiful plan of redemption, right? People who just keep not deserving, not deserving, just follow the Old Testament story. People who don't deserve, don't deserve, don't deserve kindness and grace. And, and the Lord relentlessly is faithful and shows grace to those who don't deserve it. It's just a beautiful story. This is why we love this story. That's why we love to talk about it every week. Well, Jesus is the founder of our salvation. So what's that mean? Well, that word founder, it's, it's translated different ways. I don't know what your, your translation says, but uh, many commentators are, are, are troubled with this or not exactly clear how to, how to uh, translate this word. Uh, but perhaps trailblazer or pioneer, these are some words that are sometimes offered to help us understand what's going on. You might think uh, of Moses sort of leading the way, follow me, we're leaving Egypt, right? And so he's just trailblazing the way out and everybody just follows him out. Now, Jesus is kind of like that. By the way, he's better than Moses and uh, the author of Hebrews will get to that in the next couple chapters. But the other thing is that Jesus is not merely just saying, I'm going to lead the way. Don't worry. You just follow me. I'm going to go to the cross. And in a few minutes, you guys just follow me. You get on your own cross. That's not what Jesus does, right? <laughs> he is a trailblazer who goes before us. But he's the trailblazer who goes before us by dying so that we skip the dying part. That is the dying, uh, suffering the wrath of God for our sins part. Right? We skip that part because he has done it. And he's blazing a trail... Right, leading us all the way to our heavenly home, uh, but he does it as the one who's already achieved all that is necessary to get us there. So he is the trailblazer, though. Right? He leads the way. We have to follow him. Right? But he leads by conquering, leading the captives free. Well, he was perfect through suffering. Now, what's that mean? That's a great phrase. That's a phrase that I think sometimes troubles people. When they first read it, they think, he was made perfect. That, you know, that, I mean, perhaps this suggests that Jesus wasn't perfect and he became perfect all of a sudden. Is there something wrong with Jesus? I think that's probably not the best reading of what's going on here. I think probably the best reading of what's going on here is to see that this, this phraseology, this idea of being made perfect, is perhaps similar to thinking about somebody being qualified for office. Uh, the way perhaps that we see in the Old Testament that a uh, priest 
would be qualified for the priesthood. They would go through an ordination service. And so if you look through Exodus 29 or Leviticus chapter 7 and Leviticus chapter 8, you will see ways in which the priest was ordained, was, was you know, now, having come through all the preparation, having come through the ordination, he is now qualified to serve as the high priest. And in a similar way, Jesus has come through what it took for him to come through in order to be our great high priest. And it's not because there's any defect in him. As a matter of fact, as fully God, he's sort of too good to die. <laughs> he actually has to take on flesh so that he can in the flesh die. Right? So he, he, has, to, he has to put on flesh. To, to, because he's not only the high priest who gives the sacrifice, as Hebrews will, later, uh, will get to later in the book, he is in fact the sacrifice, right? So that means he will die. And so he had to become perfect, the perfectly suited to be the sacrifice. And in order to be perfectly suited to be the sacrifice, he had to become uh, less than unkillable. <laughs> he had to put on flesh and, uh, and be able to die. So this is what we, uh, I think, the best understanding there of what it means that Jesus became perfect. Now he's perfectly set, uh, having, having taken on flesh. Now he can, in fact, die in the place of sinners. And he can taste death for, taste death for us. Now, uh, in the next verse, then, I want to move, move right along to verse 10. Jesus then, we've already said this, but Jesus now, we're seeing, is sharing our humanity. He has the same humanity we have. Verse 11, for he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. And then we come up with this great phrase that we're going to be talking about for a bit. That's why he's not afraid to call them brothers. Now, the idea, though, here is that we all have one source. I have the same source. We have the same source that uh, Jesus has. And so what's the, the question is, well, what's that mean? Well, most, most basically, we might say they all have the, we all have the same source as uh, we, we, are, we, we look to the Father, Right? We all owe what we have to the Father. And so Jesus in his flesh, uh, through the incarnation, Jesus then shares human flesh. And even though he was eternally divine in his flesh, Jesus, like us, needs to look to the Father for, for providing all that he needs. Right? So in this way, he's like us. And we're even going to see in the next verse that Jesus is going to show a looking to the Father. Right? Right? So in his flesh, in his divinity, he doesn't need, but in, in his flesh, he does look to the Father like a human would need to look to the Father. And uh, lest, we dis, let, lest we flatten this too much, uh, there's still a distinction. Jesus does not become a full man and no longer divine. Right? He still is fully divine. Right? So <laughs> that's why this phrase says... Uh, The, this, this phrase here shows that uh, he is the one who sanctifies us, right? Let me just read that, that passage again, that section again. For he who sanctifies, that is Jesus, and those who are being sanctified all have one source, right? So, so Jesus is, is like us, but he's not like us in needing to be sanctified. Actually, he's still the sanctifier, right? He's still God. But he is the one who looks to, looks to the Father uh, in a sense like we do. So now one thing that this passage is helping us do is add to our description of what a true uh, Christian looks like. What a true brother of Jesus looks like. Last week we emphasized the way that the Bible says that you are a child of God if you have faith. This week the passage is basically saying how do you know that you're the brother of Jesus? You know that you are the brother of Jesus. You know that Jesus died for you. You know that he is your savior. You know that because you are being sanctified. Right? You are being sanctified. As a matter of fact, later in the book of Hebrews, uh, chapter 12, verse 14, strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness. That's another way to talk about that work of sanctification, the holiness. And for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Christians... True Christians, <laughs> not, not just those who claim to be Christians, but those who are truly saved by a miracle of regeneration are being sanctified, right? So if you see no sanctification in you, you may want to rethink the claim to faith because those who have true faith are sanctified. As a matter of fact, this passage says the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. I'm not saying you're going to look like the most holy person you've ever known. I'm just saying it must be present. Because that's what this passage is saying. 
Right? And so the idea here is the sanctification then is a work of the Holy Spirit in those who have been born again, conforming them into the image of Jesus Christ. Right? But again, that's described. Who, who are the brothers of Jesus? Those being sanctified. Those being made holy by the Holy Spirit. So, so far now, we've seen how Jesus saves and sanctifies his brothers. And by the way, this is the way that Jesus talks about those who have faith in him. Uh, Jesus speaks in Mark 3.35. He, he, his mother had come to see him, remember? And they're like, hey, your mother's out there. And Jesus basically says, uh, you know, about his, his, his biological mother... Uh, he says, actually, whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. And so the Lord in his own ministry, Jesus in his own ministry, basically said, well, I guess another way to say sanctified, those who do the will of my father, uh, they're the brothers and sisters. So Jesus talked about those who had faith in him as his brothers, as his sisters, Yet we said at the beginning that a careful reading of the Old Testament would clue you into this, didn't we? And notice that in arguing that Jesus is the brother of the redeemed, the evidence actually comes from the Old Testament. So right after it says he'll call, he's not ashamed to call them brothers, there's immediately several quotations from the Old Testament that basically the main point of those verses is uh, that the Old Testament speaks of the one who would come and be Messiah is referring to those who are his as brothers, right? So if you read your Old Testament carefully, you would know that whoever the Messiah would be would be saving his brothers, right? That, that, and, and that's, that, that's a, again, a, a bit of the argument. It's not enough to say the New Testament says that Jesus uh, was the brother of those he came to save. It, you have to see also that the plan of redemption was giving you glimpses along the way. If you knew where to look, if you, if you paid attention as you read, you would see that it was pointing to Jesus being the brothers. And so we do well then to say, okay, so where does he point to? Well, he points to the book of Psalms. He points to the book of Isaiah. He points to words that actually in their context are attributed to David in the Psalms and Isaiah in the book of Isaiah. And he's saying, he's quoting the words of those guys and saying... These are my, th that's how we know he was going to be brother, right? And so these words are not just to be read as Isaiah's words and David's words. They're meant to be words, read as Jesus' words. And if you might say, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't like to read my Bible that way. I just want to say the Bible teaches you to read the Bible this way. That's, uh, uh, perhaps that's the most compelling thing I can say to you. Right? The, the, the Bible is teaching you to read these Old Testament words and to read them as the words of Jesus. And if you don't read your Bible that way, then you don't read the, your Bible the same way that those who wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit read their Bible. And I suggest we all conform our hermeneutics uh, to the model set forth in the Bible. And so let's spend some time examining, the, examining these things. Uh, sometimes, and what one we're going to look at is a messianic psalm. Sometimes these passages are just foreshadowing, right? A, the great redemption that Jesus would accomplish through what we might call lesser redemptions in the Old Testament. But the Old Testament stories are not mere random stories. But they point to the one great story. To the hero of all heroes, and his name is Jesus. Now, we're going to spend a few minutes then trying to look at those passages in the Old Testament. First... Verse 12, let me just read verse 12 to you. Saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. So this is a verse just out of Psalm 22, verse 22. And, uh, and let's just think about, you know, don't, don't, let's set this passage aside for a minute. We'll come back to it. But let's look at Psalm 22 uh, and let's just think about it. And I'm going to go quickly. I'm just going to give you an overview. But what's going on in Psalm 22? Now this is, by the way, commonly considered a messianic psalm, Right? But it's written about David who was opposed by his enemies. David cries out for help. In the end of verse 19, beginning of verse 20, he says, O oh, you my help, come quickly to my aid, deliver my soul from the sword. And again, if you've ever been in trouble, you should just do the same thing. <laughs> help me, Lord. I'm in great trouble. Help me, Lord. That's exactly what David is doing here. And he actually has 
Uh, in this also a, a sort of built-in confidence, a trust in the Lord. Look at verse 9. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. And it shows up other places, but basically the idea is I'm crying out to you. And by the way, I trust you. Matter of fact, he says, you made me trust you. But he does say, I trust you. Right? And then David says in verse uh, 23, he expects delivery. He says, you who fear the Lord praise him. All you offspring of Jacob glorify him and stand in awe of him. All you offspring of Israel. So he's, he's basically, you know, he's crying out, but he's trusting. And he's, he's, he's going ahead and praising the Lord. He's expecting <laughs> delivery here. And then we see, uh, just now to look at the very text that, that is being cited in Hebrews, Psalm twenty two twenty two, 22. I will tell of your name to my brothers. Isn't that interesting? So David is saying... I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. So the confidence that David has is that in the end, this will end to the praise of God. And there's, of course, a great trust in the Lord that's being expressed. And so, but the, I think the interesting thing is that these words that are clearly historically David's words are now put in Jesus's, I mean, are spoken about of Jesus and saying Jesus is the one saying this. And you think, well, this... How does this work? And again, let's spend a few minutes thinking about this. Well, Psalm 22, you may want to know, is considered messianic not just because of the verse we just quoted, but because of uh, the opening words of that psalm. And these words probably will sound very familiar to you. Here are the first words out of Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Sound familiar? Right. The words of Jesus on the cross, Right? In Matthew 27, 46. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? So here we have Jesus looking at <laughs> Psalm 22 and he's using those words, right, to connect himself to that psalm. Or again, in Psalm 22, 7, all who see me mock me. That's what Psalm 22, 7 says. And of course, that happened to Jesus on the cross, didn't it? Everybody who looked at Jesus was mocking him. Matthew 27, 43, he trusts in the Lord, let, let God deliver him now, right? <laughs> They're mocking him, right? Let God, if, if, if he trusts the Lord, let, let God deliver him. They, they don't think he will. They're mocking him. And again, there's a tie between Jesus and even Jesus' death on the cross to Psalm 22. Jesus is using those words, not accidentally. And like David, Jesus cries out to the Lord. He is confident in the Lord and he expects delivery. Which actually he doesn't expect delivery by not dying. He expects, expects delivery by dying and then being raised victorious, right? So he expects delivery though, doesn't he? And again, this, te this text is about David and it is about Jesus. And so it can be said that Jesus is speaking then in Psalm 22, 22. And that's why the author of Hebrews is happy to say, I know these are David's words, but actually these are, these are words of Jesus. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And the main point seems to be that Jesus was made man. He put on flesh in the incarnation, and he is the brother of the redeemed. Yes, in one sense, Jesus is the exalted Lord. We have to remember the divinity of Jesus, right? He is the exalted Lord. So when we get to the end of Hebrews, uh, chapter uh, 12, verses uh, 22 through 24, uh, it says, You have come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Reju uh, Jerusalem, the innumerable angels and festal gatherings, and to the assembly of the firstborn who enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the sprinkling of blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. But here it is, Jesus, by the end of the book of Hebrews, being magnified and glorified because he is the exalted Lord. And yet still in the beginning here, we can th talk about Jesus in the flesh and say that he's going to save his brothers. And again, our, our text is, speaks of Jesus speaking praise. If these are now the words of Jesus, now Jesus is saying, I will sing of your praise. Which again highlights his humanity. He's our brother. In the flesh, he identifies with those who need the Father and praise God. So... A word then again about reading your Bible in this way. I think, by the way, I think this is the right way to read it. I think this is making sense out of what the author of Hebrews is trying to do here, right? He's saying these words are Jesus' words, even though they're David's words, even though they're from the Old Testament. 
And again, I want to reiterate, the Bible teaches us to, to read, the, read it this way. And the way I suggest that you do it, though, is to, uh, what we might say, see and love the stories of the Old Testament. Right? See the stories. Love them. They should be your favorite stories. You should love stories, those very stories, and honestly, you should love stories like that. <laughs> and we are sort of like that. We, we like the story where the hero comes in and saves those who are like greatly in need of help. Right? I, I hope you like that kind of story. I hope the kind of story where the wicked people do wicked things and just become more and more wicked, that those aren't your favorite kind of stories. Right? There's something about us that we like the stories that in, in a way remind us a bit of the good stories, uh, the best stories perhaps even that we read in our own scriptures. But I also want you to see, not just to love the stories, but to see how Jesus fulfills these stories, how Jesus is better, right? Jesus is a, the better hero. Sometimes we read those Old Testament stories and we look at David and we're like, see how David slay that giant? You can do it too. And the, <laughs> the point is, no, you need somebody to come in and stand between you and your trouble and to fight your battle for you and to deliver you. That's who Jesus is. You're not the hero. Jesus is the hero. David, for all that he did valiantly by the Lord's power, still needed someone to save him because he's the one who sleeps with Bathsheba, has Bathsheba's husband uh, killed, and, you know, uh, uh, and, and was not even a, a particularly good father to his own children, to the uh, harm of the kingdom. So we, we, we can't keep reading the Bible story saying, be like so-and-so. We can say, try to be as, you know, the, the good parts of the of our heroes, but recognize no matter how much you try, you won't be good enough and you'll need a hero to come in and save you. And again, his name is Jesus. So emulate the great while trusting in the true hero, right? You're saved by faith in the hero, the Jesus who comes in and lives as good as you should have lived, right? You're saved by faith in that hero. And because you love the hero, Partially, you love the hero because of the type of hero he is, right? He, 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 he is the one who trusts in, in the Father, right? He cries out to the Father, but he's confident when he cries out. And you might try to do that some days, and some days you don't live up to that. That's always going to be true of us, too. We'll try to live the right way. We won't live up to it. We'll always be thankful of the gospel on those days. Right? But we're never going to say, even if we happen to give it, get it right, to say, now I know I'm right with God because I did it. No. <laughs> it's always trust in Jesus. But because we love the hero, we're like the little kids who dress up in the Batman costume because we want to be like the hero. We want to be great in the way that God defines greatness. And the definition of greatness as God defines it is Jesus Christ himself. You want to be like Jesus because you love Jesus and you think the awesome things about Jesus. You want to be true about you. You try to achieve it. You'll never achieve it. But that's the aim of the good. Not what the world says the great is no Jesus is the mark of greatness but we don't become like Jesus or try to become like Jesus to save ourselves we trust in Jesus to save us and then we still try to be there just like Jesus and because we're so bad at it we say Lord by your Holy Spirit empower me help me to live better more like Jesus but never to trust in my good works Well, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the last one. But it's a similar story, uh, that last verse. Uh, it's pointing to Isaiah. Uh, it shows the ways that <laughs> Jesus is compared to Isaiah, uh, waiting on the Lord, living in the fear of the Lord, not living in the fear of man. It highlights the ways that you and I are tempted to look to the world for deliverance instead of to the Lord for deliverance. It shows how Jesus did it better than, than God's people did in the Old Testament. They didn't wait on the Lord. They decided to make their own alliances, right? And how it led to a bad end. And you, when you're in a hard spot, shouldn't think, you know what, I should do what the world would do here. Instead, you should say, I will trust in the Lord, knowing that Jesus has already perfectly done that for you. And now, Daddy's perfectly done it for you. He is your perfect high priest. You can trust in him. And you should live your life trying to trust in the Lord in your sufferings, in your hard times. But if you happen to fail, be thankful that Jesus has been perfect in your place. And again, we, we, it's a similar sort of dynamic. And again, I just want to suggest, as I briefly went through that, with not, not, didn't give it uh, proper help here, to say this is the way we read our Bible. 
We read our Bible not with Isaiah as the hero and not with David as the hero, but with Jesus as the hero. And he was the hero all along. <laughs> it never was going to work out that that nation of Israel just pulled themselves up and started doing everything right. They always were going to need a savior. And finally, Jesus comes in as the perfect son of God. When Israel was not the perfect son of God, Jesus comes in as the perfect son of God and perfectly obeys God and does it in your place and saves you on the basis of that and still calls you to try to be God's people as best you can, relying on the Holy Spirit, right? We're still trying to be sanctified, holy. The Lord means to make us holy. We depend on him for that. We just don't say my salvation is based on me being good enough. I hope in all of this, We've tried to make the gospel clear. Don't trust in you, trust in Jesus. You need someone to come in and be better than you'll ever be. You need to try to be better than you're trying to be, but at the end of the day, trust in the one who was perfect and then rest in his, uh, his provision, but then also lean on him, depend on his empowering Holy Spirit that you might live better than you're trying to live right now. This sort of walking in holiness and depending on his work of sanctification in our life is also part of the Christian life and I hope through all of that we can marvel we've only scratched the surface of the glories of an incarnate Jesus Christ <laughs> but what a wonderful picture we have painted here right one who knew we were so inept we could never save ourselves and he takes on flesh because he says I know the only way to save inept and wicked people like this is for me to come down, humble myself, die for them, and become their brother and bring salvation. And, and for all of us who are living in perfect lives and walking through suffering or walking through trouble, let us just be thankful that our brother is going to take care of us. We don't have to worry. You don't have to fret. Is it all going to work out? How am I getting out of this situation? Just, just lean on your powerful brother, Jesus Christ. Your perfect and powerful brother, Jesus Christ. And be encouraged. Now, don't be encouraged and, and neglect, neglect him. Be encouraged and lean on him. Be, but be so thankful that he's your brother. That he doesn't say, who are you? Get out of here. He says, yes, I know you. I gave my life for you. I love you. And lean on him. Well, may the Lord bless the preaching of the word today. Lord God, we're so thankful for uh, just a word about the glories of Jesus Christ. A word about how not only Jesus is a wonderful Savior, but your plan all along was to save through Christ. And how the Old Testament, if we read it correctly, is so full of Christ. That we are fools to read the Old Testament as if it's not about Christ. Lord, help us to learn from your word our hermeneutical instincts that we might learn by being instructed from your word about how to interpret the Bible, that we might learn to better read our Bibles and see Jesus more frequently where he really is there and marvel at your plan of redemption and to marvel at one who is fully God and yet fully man, who became our brother, and that through faith in him, our sins can be forgiven. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.